Egyptian culture took shape around a series of religious temples built in carefully chosen sites along the Nile. For the Egyptian priests, all forms in the universe grow outwards and need a container to protect their development. The temples were the receptacles that allowed the development of their civilization. Each temple manifested a different kind of understanding of the universe, a different fundamental principle, and was used to communicate it to their people to produce an evolution of consciousness. Each temple played the role of a different organ in the country's body with a different function, devoted to teaching and exploring a different religious topic. In that way, they understood the houses of God. For thousands of years, the frontiers of the kingdom were respected by all empires of Asia. The pharaohs of Egypt, who were initiated by the priests of the Eye of Horus, never wanted to conquer other territories and the country was a haven of peace. The end of the empire began with the disappearance of their highest priests in the Red Sea crossing while in the pursuit of Moses. He was one of their last high initiates. The empire ended in the chaos, the destruction of their temples and the extermination caused by the Persian Cambyses II. When Cyril died, the king of the largest kingdom of Asia, who maintained a peaceful and respectful relationship with Egypt, his son, Cambyses II, rose to the command of the most powerful army at the time. A cruel and brutal tyrant who hated the wisdom, stability and power of the pharaohs was obsessed with proving that his gods were more powerful. He invaded Egypt in the year 525 BC. He murdered Semithicus III, the last pharaoh legitimately born in these lands, and almost all the priests of the school of mysteries of the Eye of Horus. The temples were destroyed, and the papyrus with stored wisdom of many generations were burnt. The knowledge was lost in the darkness, and the powerful Egyptian wisdom disappeared with their high priests. Cambyses II established a ruthless oppression that lasted 200 years until the arrival in the year 332 BC of Alexander the Great, who was received as a savior by the Egyptians. Alexander ordered the reconstruction of the temples and after his death, Ptolemaeus I, one of his generals, began the Ptolemaic dynasties that reigned for almost 300 years. The temple devoted to Hatter, originally built in Dendra, in the year 5400 BC, was reconstructed by the Macedonian kings as a pious method to make their power legitimate. In one of the subterranean crypts, hieroglyphics were found that demonstrate that it was reconstructed exactly following the ancient plans and designs left by the wise priest Imhotep. The religious complex of Dendra is located on the 26 degrees north latitude. An ancient road that leads to the Red Sea began there. A little to the south, thousands of years after the foundation of the temple, Thebes, the capital of the new kingdom, was built. A ceremony called Putser took place on a starry evening of a summer solstice at the dawn of their civilization. In an area over the Nile, carefully chosen because of its direct relationship to certain stars. The pharaoh of Egypt and the supreme priest of the mystery school of the Eye of Horus, surrounded by all their people, located a group of stars over the north pole of the planet. They called it the constellation of Tuaret, and its symbol was a red hippopotamus mother. In our times, we call the same group of stars Draconis, and its symbol is a dragon serpent. 
The most brilliant of all was Alpha Draconis, the star that in that era was located exactly over the axis of the planet and that 4,320 years after was replaced by Polaris, the one which currently guides our navigators. The movement of the solar system in its revolution around the center of the galaxy determines that during that cycle of 25,920 years, six different stars would shine over the pole. The star over the pole represented the fundamental motherly force in the sky, the generator of the substance that allowed the development of life in the universe, the feminine principle called Hatter, to which this temple was consecrated. The pharaoh and the supreme priest oriented a line between two stakes towards Alpha Draconis. The priestess, with a gold mallet, nailed the stakes lining up the direction of the temple's axis. They then set the four cornerstones to begin the protective wall of the complex, a very high wall to fence out the enemies of the life they wished would be there forever. The principal door was located northward, the last of a series of aligned doors that, departing from the Sancta Santorum of Hatter's temple, framed the sky segment where Alpha Draconis appeared making it easy to find it and systematically register its movements during the night. That same night, but facing west, they located another star at 90 degrees to the previous one. They called it Sirius and was the symbol of Isis in the sky. In her honor, they built a second temple with its axis and the second door in the wall of the complex aligned in the star's direction. The door of the Temple of Isis framed the sector of the sky where Sirius rose with the sun trailing her and appeared on each 21st day of June, day of the summer solstice. The temple grew inside the high walls while the priest recorded the movement of the stars, studied the processes impelled by their energies and carved on its walls the conclusions on that sacred topic. Sirius, the symbol of Isis, was called the Dog Star because it follows the Orion constellation, the impersonation of Osiris in the sky. After being hidden for 120 days, it reappeared over the horizon, marking the moment when the Nile waters begin to overflow. It was then visible for 40 days, the same times that the floods lasted. Because of this synchronicity, Cyrus became very important and was used to divide the year in three periods called tetramens, determined by the flood of the Nile. The New Year's festivities began when the Nile overflowed and Sirius reappeared in the sky. Once the star disappeared, the river recovered its normal levels. The calendar and the synchronization of Egyptian life with the sun and the stars was so important that the pharaoh, upon assuming his high role, had to swear never to change the dates of the calendar. However, the day Sirius reappeared in the sky depended on the latitude of the temple in which it was awaited, since in the southern Elephantine it was seen seven days before than in Bubastis to the north. The priests also used the sun as a clock to help determine the duration of the year, since the summer solstice happened at the same time Upon entering Dendra, the visitor passes a series of constructions built by the Romans during the kingdoms of the emperors Trajan and Domitian. A series of kiosks frame the north door that is enclaved in the massive walls that protect the temple.
Upon crossing the portal, the principal facade of the grandiose temple appears, with its six Hathoric columns and its northern oriented axis, precisely aligned for the study of the stars. Very near the entrance of the complex, a chapel devoted to the birth of Horus, the symbol of consciousness illumination, is found. It was built by the Romans during the reign of the Emperor Augustus to celebrate illumination, represented by his birth from Isis and his father Osiris. In its walls are carved love scenes of Isis and Osiris, the birth of their son Horus and the presentation of the child. The scene of God giving the boy material form in the pottery wheel is also there. Over each of its columns is the divinity Bess, the protector of pregnant women that favors the birth of children. To the south of this chapel, the ruins of a Christian basilica are found. It was built in the 5th century AD, during the time of the destruction of the sacred figures' faces in the walls of the temple. The ruins of a sanatorium remain near the main temple, built to lodge the sick that went to the shrine of Hathor, looking to recover from their illnesses. The priests of the temple were the doctors of their times. Hatter, the feminine force multiplier of life, was revered as a compassionate figure. The people traveled long distances to pray in her temple, be bathed in the sacred pools, and receive the medicine and the care they needed. The complex of Dendra could harbor thousands of people. Inside its walls, there were bakeries, breweries, stoves, stores, rain depots, rooms for the priests and the initiates, in hundreds of arches similar to these in the front of the Rasmussen in Thebes. Around its exterior walls, the people built their houses producing a development pole under the direct care of the knowledge custodians, the priests of the Eye of Horus. The design of the facade of Hatter's temple is different to the traditional Egyptian temples. The columns are joined up to mid-height by decorated walls. The 18 columns of the Room of Life support a very high roof carved with information about the stars and their movements. Symbolically, the sky was supported by Hatter's columns. Each column has the form of a sistrum a sacred instrument that induces vibration in a series of metal discs used by the priestess of Hutter, the divinity of dance and music, to produce a singular sound that lulls consciousness. On top of the column, four phases of Hutter look towards each cardinal point, symbolizing her force, supporting the sky vault and present everywhere around the world. Her serpent eyes and cow ears produce an almost alien image associated in many legends with the planet Venus. The temple was found in very good condition by Napoleon's troops due to the fact that it was buried under the sand for thousands of years. In that state, it was a refuge for the nomadic tribes that smoked the precious colors of its symbolic sky with their fires. In the ceiling of this great room, the last priests of Dendra carved the astronomical tables produced by several generations of priests, 
so that this knowledge wouldn't disappear forever. All the zodiacal constellations with their symbols are represented over the sacred boats along images of the divinity Nut, the symbol of the skies, who every night devoured the solar disk to give birth to it at dawn. The last remaining priests transcribed the astronomical records on the walls and ceilings of the temple from important papyrus that were saved of the Cambyses' destruction to preserve them for future generations. In this salon, called the House of Life, the scribes wrote the theological works, the ritual words and the astronomical tables on sacred papyrus. This small chapel stored the papyrus used every day. In this great salon, art, theology, magic, astronomy and medicine were taught to the disciples of the School of Mysteries. Here, the priests systematically recorded the movements of the circumpolar constellations to track the precession of the equinoxes. Upon crossing the very high salon, a lower room supported by six columns appears. It was called the Apparitions Room. The brilliant golden statue of the goddess Hatter appeared here, for the first time leaving the darkness of its sanctuary when departing for the religious ceremonies and processions. In the temple's high floor, there is a chapel devoted to Osiris, the symbol of consciousness development, the process through which reincarnation transmutes original animality and permits humans to become super beings. Another chapel has the famous Dendra Zodiac that illustrates how this evolution of consciousness occurs while the solar system orbits around the center of the galaxy. Around this room are found the six spaces for the daily rituals. The first kept the objects devoted to the cult. The next is the room for purification that has a door that leads to the sacred lake which was used at dawn by the priests in their cleanliness rituals. Each temple had a sacred lake lined in stone and with a series of staircases to allow the priests to get into the water and be purified before beginning their service. The next room was used to organize the ritual ceremonies. From here, a spiral staircase leads to the terrace of the temple, used during nighttime to record the celestial vault. There is a door on the left side of this room that leads to the outside to receive the offerings given by the people to their spiritual guides. The food and animals devoted to the sacrifice were stored and prepared in the other two chambers. After the room of the apparitions comes the hall of the two staircases of the temple. To the right, the spiral staircase used by the procession with the portable sanctuary, the golden boat of Hatter's figure, that was taken to the terrace to await the rising of the sun during the summer solstice. In the staircase symbolizing the spiral of light, each turn is a higher life in the scale of consciousness. To the left, there is a long straight staircase used by the procession to draw down the new fire to the country. The straight staircase is the symbol of the spirit which descends into matter to embody and live the experiences that allow for the comprehension of the universe. 
Upon crossing this portal, the antechamber of the sanctuary is found. Fire, the instrument of the gods, was kept alive there. Fire is the first substance of the universe, the most elemental form of matter. This was the place where the offerings of Hatter were submitted. To the left of this chamber was the chapel of the golden boat. The portable sanctuary was the symbol of all movement for the Egyptians. The movement of the solar disk, movement of the stars and the planets, and the movement of human consciousness. The boat of life carried the figure of Hatter down the Nile to the nearby temple of Horus in Edfu, in the florid procession of the new moon, the third month of summer during the festival of the beautiful encounter. An open space without a ceiling communicated the pure chapel or wabit with the antechamber of the sanctuary. The symbolic figures of the divinities were drawn to this space to renew their forces with the energy of the sun. Deeper into the temple, it becomes darker. The ceilings get lower and the doors more narrow. The floor rises to allow the priests to clearly see over the heads of the attendees the star Alpha Draconis. And finally, in the deepest part, aligned with its axis is the heart of the temple the most sacred space, the home of Hatter. There, her figure made of gold, the symbolic meat of the gods, with her semi-precious stone eyes, rested inside a small tabernacle. Only the Pharaoh and the highest priests of the School of Mysteries of the Eye of Horus could enter the Sanctus Antorum after being purified in a ceremony with water. The Egyptians believed in several divinities, but only one God. This only God has a masculine part that emits information and a feminine part that provides the substance to gestate all beings. They gave three names to the masculine part of the only God to distinguish separate functions. It was called Atum, when he remained motionless containing the absolute information before the creation of the universe. They called him Ta, when set in motion to emit the information that creates the universe, the stars, the planets, and the natural kingdoms on them. And they called him Amon-Ra when he created the consciousness of man. In the same way, his feminine part also had three names. They called her Nun when she was only one homogeneous substance, the amniotic liquid of the universe, virginal without form, and in a state of perfect balance. They called her Sekhmet to symbolize the radiant substance, the fire, the multiplying principle in movement. It is in that condition that Sekhmet gestates Nefertum, the universe, that reconciles and harmonizes temporarily the opposing forces. Fire produces movement, time, space. Its intensity condenses matter into successive states, air, water, and earth. Fire also produces the force of life, represented by Hatter, the substance that gestates and multiplies consciousness to experience space-time. And they called her Mut, when she gave birth to the four forces that impel the consciousness of man to evolve, the four brothers, 
Osiris, Isis, Zeth, and Nephthys. Understanding Hatter in this way, she is the boat of life, the boat of light. She represents love, the great matrix of consciousness in the universe, the boat of the north, containing the principle of all nature. Here, in her tabernacle, Hatter, the force of life, received the prayers of those who wanted to extend life or needed to heal it. Around her Sanctus and Torum, a perimetral hole is found to access a series of sanctuaries set against the exterior walls of the temple devoted to the fundamental forces. These sanctuaries had sacred symbols carved on the exterior wall of the temple to allow people to locate them from the outside. In this way, they could pray and request help from the fundamental forces because they were not allowed to enter the temple. Only priests and initiates could. To the right of the sanctuary devoted to Hatter's ear, there are two communicated sanctuaries devoted to the adoration of the only God, the creator of man's consciousness, the one who is everywhere, Amon Ra, with his carved symbols also on the exterior wall. The two connected chapels of the left contain the figures that symbolize the fundamental forces in their relationship with Hatter and her musical instrument, the Sistrum. The four sanctuaries to the right were devoted to Horus, Sokar, Isis, and to the Gnome of Dendra, the saint of the Egyptian zone where the temple is. Another chapel had the necklace of Menat, a necklace used by the supreme priest in ceremonies and processions, with four figures of Hatter, each one with a symbolic throne above it. The four thrones represented the supreme powers of the universe. Harmony love, wisdom, and the infinite force of divine will. Under the floor of the temple were found a series of crypts. There, the priests stored the most sacred elements, the written skins and the most secret papyrus concerning the revelation of the temple. This crypt has some mysterious carvings of Horus handling a special flower with a serpent in its interior. Scientific theories consider these flowers to be lamps that could be used to illuminate interior chambers and constructions below ground. Upon ascending up the straight staircase, we arrive at the terrace the space devoted to the recording of the celestial vault. In its southwest corner there is a kiosk. It was here the priests waited for the rising of the stars and the sun to light up the new fire of the country and to declare the beginning of the new year. In this small shed, the priests gathered at night to divide the celestial vault in sections they called gnomes in order to identify the movements of the stars in relation to the planet Earth. The priests of Dendra were called the Kabirim, the measurers of the sky. They made the first celestial chart, the one which recorded the relative positions of the Maseroths, the fires of the sky. Astronomy began here in Dendra, Astro means star. Astronomy means knowledge of the stars. Crossing this terrace, we arrive at the two chapels devoted to Osiris, the divine principle that symbolizes the evolution through reincarnation of all human beings. 
In them, the myth is described when his brother Seth stole his kingdom and his woman Isis, cut Osiris into 14 pieces, and dispersed the parts of his body all over Egypt. The carvings show Isis in the air like a female falcon, receiving from the phallus of Osiris the seed with the life of Horus.